Good afternoon. Welcome to Remaking the Economy, Building Narrative Power for Economic Justice. I'm Steve Dubb, Senior Editor of Economic Justice here at Nonprofit Quarterly, coming to you from Boston on land historically stewarded by the Massachusetts Nation. Uh, shortly, I'll be very excited to pass the baton to MPQ Fellow uh, Chanel Matthews of the Movement for Black Lives, who organized and is moderating uh, this really important special 90-minute panel. Uh, I'll return in about an hour to ask to answer, to ask your questions to the panelists. So please enter your questions into the question box at the bottom of your screen during the discussion, and I will get to many, as many of them as I can. I also encourage you to engage via social media, via our tap, hashtag, hashtag rebuild the economy. And a brief note on our sponsor for this webinar, MPQ gratefully acknowledges the support of Mercer. For over 75 years, Mercer has helped businesses address the health, retirement, and well-being of their employees. For more information, see www.mercer.us. Uh, thanks for joining us, and please complete the brief uh, survey after the webinar to inform our work. And with that, uh, Chanel, the mic is yours. No matter who we are or what we do, all people deserve dignity, respect, and what we need to thrive. We believe this deeply. It's why we became social change makers. It's why we do what we do. But right now, the stories told say the opposite. That poverty is inevitable. That wealth is a result of hard work. That your economic status is a choice. That you don't work hard enough if you're poor. I had to work more than one job to have a roof over your head or food on the table. You probably shouldn't have taken the job that's not paying you enough. That'd be a you problem. Placing the blame on individuals erases systems at work. Helping the rich get rich and the poor stay poor. Oh my God! <laughs> this is not an accident. It props up the status quo and distracts us from real solutions. Stories are incredibly powerful. They shape how we see the world. They tell us our history and how we move forward. As storytellers and change agents, we can dismantle these harmful narratives and write our own stories. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks, Steve. Thank you to the MPQ team. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining this session, uh, How to Tell Stories About Poverty Towards Economic Justice. I'm Chanel Matthews, and I'm calling in from Brooklyn, the land of the Lenape and the notorious B.I.G., I'm a black woman with long blonde locks wearing a cream puff sleeve top. Oh, I'm wearing green today, actually, and gold jewelry. And my interests and work are in narrative power and the black radical tradition. I serve as the communications director for the movement for black lives and belong to faculty at the new school where I teach resistance narratives and 21st century social movements. I'm also a fellow here at Nonprofit Quarterly. Uh, but today I'm wearing another hat. In 2016, I founded the Radical Communicators Network, a community of practice for activists, organizers, and other change makers working to build narrative power for social justice. Radcoms is growing and strengthening the ecosystem of social change communications by bringing together a transnational cohort of communications professionals to cross-pollinate conversations across a variety of movements, backgrounds, levels of experience, geographies, languages, and political associations and by radicalizing the field to focus on building narrative power, thereby putting people closest to the oppression at the center of our efforts. Since our founding, our network has rippled to more than 5,000 people across almost every US state and in 20 countries, illustrating a hunger for belonging and connectivity. And I wanna tell you why that's important. Insurgent social movements, like the ones to which many of us belong, require networked communities that expand beyond local bounds to transform political opportunities into long-term social change. The other RADCOMS members who worked on this project are Tommy Faust, Hina Shah, and Trina Stout, who you'll hear from soon. Next, I'm gonna pass it to Annie and Mike to introduce their teams. Hi, everybody. It's so great to be with you. I'm Annie Niemand. Um, I have brownish blonde hair pulled back. I'm wearing green, the color of our project. Um, I am calling in from Los Angeles, California on Chumash land. And I'm sitting in my dining room with my living room behind me. Um, and I am here representing this incredible team from the Center for Public Interest Communications. We are located at the University of Florida in the College of Journalism and Communications. And um, 
the people on our team that worked on this project are listed here, Rakeem Robinson, Anne C. Wright Cristiano, Jack Berry, Matt Sheehan, Lisette Tolentino, and Zakari Wallace. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Michael Huang. Uh, I, my pronouns are he, him. Um, I'm sitting in my living room uh, wearing a cream-colored sweatshirt with a splash of green in uh, solidarity with the color of our project. Um, I am a, I'm based here in Seattle, Washington, also known as Stolen Duwamish Territory. Um, and I'm here as the sole representative of an incredible and creative team called Millie. We're a creative agency focused on work at the intersection of culture, technology, and social impact. I'm also a first-generation radcomer and uh, very excited to be speaking on the design and creative side of this project. All right, so I'm going to jump in and tell you guys a little bit about what Broke is and how we came to work together. Um, and while I lay that out, could you just drop in the chat for us a trope that you've learned about poverty or wealth and where you learned that message? And just so we're all on the same page, a trope is a stereotype. So what's one trope you've learned about poverty or wealth and where did you hear that message? Go ahead and drop it in the chat. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about what Broke is. Next slide, please. So in 2019, the Center for Public Interest Communications and RADCOMS co-applied for the Gates Grand Economic Challenge, and we earned a small grant to collaborate on a project focused on narratives about poverty. Early on, we decided to focus on both poverty and wealth because we wanted to tell a more complete story. Poverty and wealth are two sides of the same coin. We were joined by Millie, and our project Broke combines the science of storytelling uh, applying what research tells us makes stories more memorable, inspiring, and actionable. Narrative power, which is a framework for social movements to take advantage of political opportunities and construct narrative interventions to disrupt hegemonic thinking and intervene uh, to expand the collective perception of what is socially, economically, and politically possible. Crafting resources for activists and communicators that are easy to use and incorporate into their work. And so we focused inward on the nonprofit and philanthropic sectors because although many organizations are advancing liberatory narratives, other well-intentioned organizations invoke harmful tropes to demonstrate their organizational effectiveness. They tell stories about how their organizations have contributed to uh, ending individual poverty. And when this happens, people with lived experience, the people who's lived the stories, they lose control over them and how their stories are told and used. And so stories of individual triumph or success really crowd out the stories that help people see how systems are designed to privilege the few over the many. As a result, we come up with the wrong solutions. So broke is a colloquialism. We use it to describe when we're out of money. It's become a stand-in for not having enough. And while it's often used flippantly, it distracts us from the broken system shaped and reshaped to advantage some as and oppress others, as well as the stories that protect those systems, stories that insist both poverty and wealth are the result of individual choices. So this project synthesizes what we learned from the research and offers a set of recommendations grounded in the science of storytelling. To arrive at these recommendations, we conducted a literature review focused on understanding prevalent narratives about poverty, a content analysis zeroing in on the storytelling of anti-poverty organizations on social media and interviews with practitioners who are actually doing the work. Altogether, we highlight bright, bright spots and we answer the questions, what are the narratives about poverty and wealth coming from the nonprofit and philanthropic sector? And do these narratives demonstrate the best of what we've learned from research and practice about how to tell stories to transform systems? We know that narratives have the power to shape solutions, public opinion, and even the way we feel about ourselves. When we share narratives grounded in truth and a belief in the humanity of all people, we create a more just world, we build empathy and change culture. This is why we have focused both on understanding the history of narratives around poverty and wealth, helping new narratives emerge. With these tools, we provide the nonprofit and philanthropic communities with an easy to use reference for communicating accurately and justly about how the rich got rich and why the poor stay poor, as well as how to use the science of storytelling to advance economic justice for all. It is also an opportunity for the nonprofit sector to confront the harmful narratives it perpetuates and for us to do better. Next slide. So um, we learned some really important things collaborating together, and I want to talk a little bit about that. We learned about pushing the bounds of philanthropy. So Radcoms and CPIC began our relationship in 2016, um, and we wanted to collaborate and have a stronger sense of each other's work. 
And so we co-applied for this grant because we believe that combining our expertise in the science of storytelling and the framework of narrative power could provide a more powerful tool for the nonprofit and philanthropic sectors to add to their narrative change toolboxes. We believe that there was something we could do together that we could not do apart. And so in co-applying uh, and incorporating multiple approaches, we added additional labor to our project because our organizations have different areas of expertise, work norms, and work styles. And so this meant that our work took longer than other organizations who are working alone. It's been my experience that we often take for granted how sophisticated social movements and movement workers are and how essential our labor is to preserving democracy. But the way that we are with each other must demonstrate the world that we want to build. And there's a term for this. It's called prefigurative politics, which is the deliberate experimental implementation of desired future social relations and practices in the here and now. Prefigurative politics is not an alternative to revolution. It's about what a successful revolution requires. Prefigurative politics is a concept coined by American academic Karl Boggs in the 1970s and has the aim of living into the values of the world that we want to see. He writes, it is the desire to embody within the ongoing political practice of a movement, those forms of social relations, decision-making, culture, and human experience that are the ultimate goal. This is based on the premise that the ends a social movement achieves are fundamentally shaped by the means it employs, and that movement should therefore do their best to choose means that embody or prefigure the kind of society they want to bring about. And we tried our very best to do that. I'll share two quick examples of how. We share decision-making as a group. If we wanna build a new society that is egalitarian, empowering, and therefore transformative, we must, we must create and participate in activities and practices that are themselves egalitarian, empowering, and therefore transformative. From the premise of the project to the final copy edits, everyone was given a chance to offer insights and feedback, and those were respected. Secondly, we valued everyone's labor, so we paid everyone. We also rejected notions of perfectionism. We supported each other when we had personal and professional emergencies. We celebrated each other's work. We held each other gently accountable. It was a challenge. There were challenges with clarity on roles and responsibilities, calendars and scheduling, and we also worked on this through the pandemic. But all in all, it was really worth it. And I wanna say something important. When we applied for this grant, we were under no assumption that $100,000 or a single project would undo centuries of anti-poverty, anti-poor people propaganda. We know that nonprofit and philanthropic infrastructure is limited in its power to transform economic systems. As Sarah Jaffe, author of Work Won't Love You Back, re, uh, writes, charity is necessarily asymmetrical and reproduces inequalities. The problems of today's nonprofit sector are outgrowths of this necessary inequality. Nonprofits exist to try to mitigate the worst effects of an unequal distribution of wealth and power, yet they are funded with the leftovers of the very exploitation the nonprofits may be trying to combat. But even before this infrastructure existed, exploited people resisted and sought to remake systems to meet their needs grounded in cooperation and collaboration. We believe that it's our task to take this work as far as possible, to break through the ceiling and develop new systems and processes to advance social justice, to measure success in terms of happiness instead of stakeholder profits, to normalize that less is more by rejecting economic growth as more fundamental than the physical, mental, and collective health of our communities and to make relationships, not transactions, the axis on which our togetherness turns. This project is one small step in that direction. Next slide. When we first started this project, we did teach-ins to teach one another a little bit about what we know. And we combined these three areas of expertise, design, the science of storytelling, and narrative power. We also engaged in meaningful collabor collaboration with our organizational partners. We interviewed them in the beginning and got an understanding of how they were telling stories about poverty and wealth, poor people and rich people. We paid them and we asked for their feedback before we published the survey. Before I close and pass it on to Annie uh, and Trina, I wanna recap three best practices towards radical collaboration among organizations and capacity building formations with social within social justice. First, don't assume that you can't push the grant application rules for a more effective, collaborative, and radical approach to movement and narrative power building. Secondly, practice prefigurative politics by living into the values that you wanna see in the world. And finally, embrace cross-discipline approaches to the work if it will make the project more effective and more impactful. On to you, Annie. 
Great, thank you. So before we jump in, we want you again to put your thoughts in the chat and let us know what are some things you would like to do but feel restricted by the nonprofit and philanthropic sectors. And while you're putting that in the chat and sharing your experiences, I'm gonna introduce you to uh, what we actually did with for this project. So what we learned studying how organizations are telling stories. We had the research question, what are the narratives about wealth and poverty coming out of the nonprofit and philanthropic sector? And just so we're all on the same uh, playing field, when we say narratives, we mean, we define narratives as a collection of stories that collectively um, provide meaning about uh, a, a phenomena in our society. So narratives are made up of stories. And so we wanted to know of all the stories that are coming out of our field, what is the narrative that's really coming out about poverty and wealth? So to do that, we did a literature review where we reviewed books, peer reviewed pieces, uh, white papers from organization, lots of important thought leadership in this space. We did a content analysis of stories being shared currently by organizations. And then we interviewed organizations that we identified as doing incredible storytelling work for economic justice. But the first thing we wanted to do was look back and see what are the stories that have been told. Thank you. Um, so I'm Trina Stout, she, her, dialing in from Shasta and Tacoma lands in Southern Oregon. And I'm sitting in my little home office area, trying to wear the team green, but the best I could do is teal. And uh, there's a white bookshelf behind me. So yeah, as Annie mentioned, we, as part of the literature, looked back before um, to ground ourselves at poverty and wealth narratives, uh, because many of them are, are really, really old, right? These go back hundreds of years. They're so deep as to be sort of unconscious and unquestioned. Um, and a lot of the narratives that folks typed in the chat at the top of the call, they they don't come out of nowhere, right? Uh, and many have, as Culture Hack Labs reminds us, they have evolved, mutated, converged over the years. So we want to focus on just three today that are still relevant to the present. Next slide. So first, we wanted to start on a positive or hopeful note that it does not have to be the way it is now. It was not always this way. It doesn't have to be. Um, pre-colonial and pre-capitalist narratives around poverty and wealth, well, there wasn't poverty in a lot of communities. Edgar Villanueva talks in his book, Decolonizing Wealth, about how many indigenous cultures didn't even have a vocabulary word for that because they would never let it happen. Um, people took care of each other. Uh, they didn't have a word for poverty. The closest thing was to be without family or to be without kin. Uh, so the, the narratives were around reciprocity, interdependence, care, collaboration, uh, again, <sighs> taking care of each other. And this manifested as gift economies. And I just want to read a short excerpt from Robin Wall Kimmerer's essay, The Service Berry, on gift economies. In a gift economy, wealth is understood as having enough to share, and the practice for dealing with abundance is to give it away. In fact, status is determined not by how much one accumulates, but by how much one gives away. The currency in a gift economy is relationship, which is expressed as gratitude, as interdependence, and as the ongoing cycles of reciprocity. A gift economy nurtures the community bonds which enhance mutual well being. The economic unit is we rather than I, as all flourishing is mutual. Next slide. Unfortunately, Europeans took a wrong turn. And by the 1600s, we have uh, these two narratives that came up a lot in the chat earlier or the impact of them did. So the first is predestination. And that is this concept. Um, so the Puritans in what is now New England, they had this belief that God chooses some people, the elect, to be saved and everybody else is is to be damned so before you're even born god has decided if you're going to heaven or if you're going to hell but how could you tell during life on earth like who was who and so they decided that whether you're prosperous or whether you're poor is like the sign from god as to which group you fall into 
And so for the first time, we get narratives as poverty, narratives of poverty as justified, even as divinely ordained. And we get this concept of the undeserving poor. Because before that, even in European cultures that created poverty, there was still like, oh, that's a bummer that you're poor. Here's some alms for the poor. But now we get um, this concept of the undeserving poor, people who do not deserve even sympathy because they brought this poverty on themselves through moral failure. And we still see some of that contempt for the poor today in media coverage and in current dominant narratives. The other thing we get is this Protestant work ethic to, to come out of that time. So trying in an effort to prove that they were among the elect, this, this saved group that was going to go to heaven, um, Protestants practiced hard work and self-denial, which led to wealth accumulation. And this was another first, um, because the Protestant work ethic valued work for its own sake, rather for its results, and replaced the previous Catholic belief that one should only acquire as much wealth as is needed to live well. So, and these narratives of work itself, of wealth as morally good, they persist today. We see it in praise of like hustle culture, billionaires, the grind, putting in long hours. Um, that is all still with us. Next slide. Oh, wait, back one. And then the last one we get is individualism. Uh, the last one we want to, to bring forward today. And that is another thing that I saw a lot in the chat. So this bootstraps myth, uh, also known as meritocracy, this idea that an individual can lift themselves up the social and economic ladder just through individual effort, hard work, and personal responsibility without any other help. Um, this sort of idea of the self-made man. These narratives blame individuals for their failures and credit them for their successes, when in reality, hundreds of government policies in employment, pay, education, housing, banking, law enforcement, courts, healthcare, and other institutions operate every day to largely determine people's economic outcomes. Next slide. So yeah, so what are some narratives around poverty and wealth that you see nonprofits and philanthropy specifically using today? And as you're thinking of those, I will pass it back to Annie. Great. And thank you for dropping those in the chat. Um, this this uh, timeline was incredibly helpful for us to see the deep roots of narratives that are all around us today. Um, going back to history, but we also wanted to look at what are the existing narratives right now, specifically coming from the nonprofit and philanthropic sector. So the first thing we did was a literature review. Um, and one of the areas that we looked was academic literature, peer reviewed research published by scholars who were studying nonprofits and philanthropy and the social change sector and particularly narratives. And what we actually found was that there was not that, there hasn't been that much research on it particularly in the United States. And so we came across about a dozen studies, but we decided to focus on five studies that provided case studies for us. They looked at specific organizations that are part of this sector and the types of stories that they were sharing. And you could see here in the middle column, the different organizations that were featured in those papers and the citation, and this is in our report. So you can go read those papers if you like. And after reviewing those five case studies, we looked for themes and here's some of the big themes that we saw from based off of the scholarship of the academics. So organizations share stories of individuals who are able to become contributing members of a capitalist society by joining the middle class or starting a business. Success was how, how well was an individual able to move from their, where they were to this ideal middle class and there was usually some entrepreneurship that was tied to that. We also saw that people who live in poverty are often absent from the stories told about them. When, when stories are shared, people who experience poverty are just a homogenous group of people without names and, li and unique lives and nuances that was missing. We also saw that organizations share partial stories about poor people, only sharing aspects of their lives related to being poor or getting out of poverty. So if they were highlighting a, uh, even a success case 
as an organization, they would often just feature details about that character related to being poor or getting out of poverty. We don't get to know them in terms of their hobbies, their interests, their families, what their dog's name is. We didn't get all of those in details that help us see people as whole people. Um, and what was even more startling was that people who can't move out of poverty because of if they, they face certain barriers, if they're children and they can't start businesses, that sort of thing, they were completely absent. We also saw that stories told promote individual level change over systems change, even when an organization acknowledges systems change is needed. And this was a result of organizations needing to tell stories that provide um, credibility for their existence, which is, I think, a concept many of you might be familiar with, but a lot of the stories that organizations are telling are, are showing the need for their existence in order to receive funding or charity donations um, or establish a reason for being there. And in doing so, they end up telling these individualistic stories while also acknowledging that systems need to change. Um, it's sort of a PR approach. How can I tell a story about how wonderful the organization is in helping these individuals pull themselves up by their bootstraps as a way to um, hold my place in this society? Um, and we also saw that stories about people in other countries often oversimplify or glorify poverty by fe featuring people in pastoral settings. There's lots of pictures of people smiling in fields next to goats. Um, which creates an interesting narrative when those stories are shared over and over again. And uh, one of the big things that we saw was that organizations in our field, people who are trying to who address poverty, are not actually talking about wealth. And what that leads to is us thinking that wealth it wealth is natural and poverty is a choice. So then we wanted to look at okay, what are organizations in our field right now doing? Because that was that's academic literature. Academic literature takes forever to get published. So certainly we're not doing that anymore. So um, we wanted to see what nonprofits and foundations and grassroots organizations were doing. So we did a content analysis. And to start the content analysis, we surveyed two big uh, networks of people working in the social change sector. The RADCOM network made of, made of 8,000 people and the Frank network, which is a network of social change communicators and strategists. And there's about uh, 3000 people on that listserv. So we surveyed all of them and we said, please give us the name of any social change organization that's working on economic justice issues. And we got a huge list of hundreds and hundreds of organizations. And then we did social listening where we, we used the tools of social listening to look on social media to see which organizations had the loudest voice relative to their size. So even small organizations um, we looked at relative to their size. And we looked, we specifically wanted to find the grassroots organizations, the foundations, the nonprofits um, and community organizations. And we pulled the top, the top five of each of those categories and narrowed it down to 27 organizations and we have, we sampled, you know, across the different types of organizational types based off of that sample. Um, so we picked 10 organizations and we pulled uh, 27 pieces of content from each organization. And these pieces of content were specifically under sections on their website that said story um, or on social media, um, or if it was, if it was in a blog, it was a, it was um, featured as a story. And each piece had to have some connection to econom economic inequality or economic justice relevant to the work that the organization does. And so we pulled those pieces of content and then we did a qualitative analysis. And to analyze those stories, we created a rubric which we translated into a worksheet for you where we were coding each story and looking for specific elements that we learned from critical race theory, from intersectionality studies, from the science of storytelling, and from narrative power work that we know makes uh, persuasive, compelling stories for systems change. So we looked at things like, do they have plot structure? Um, who is the main character in the story? Um, who, where's the conflict in the story? Is it between people or is it between people and systems? Did the story include historical, political, geographic, social, and economic factors? 
If they talked about systems, did they actually acknowledge racism, white supremacy, classism, sexism, ableism, all of the uh, multiple forms of oppression that people can feel or experience? Who was the hero? Um, who had agency in the story? Did the story uh, reinforce any dominant narratives that we're familiar with now, like the American dream or deservingness or the welfare queen? And were the, what were the underlying morals of the story? Was it towards reparations, justice, fairness, you know, these things that we as a sector are working toward? And that is all available on our website and is a good checklist for you as you're telling stories. So I wanna just reiterate that this is a sample of 27. So this is not generalizable to everybody in the sector, although we did, Chanel and I did just share this at Southern California grant makers and the practitioners who've been doing this work for decades said that this feels true across all the organizations they've worked with, which is a great reinforcement of our findings. But I just need to say 27 pieces of content, can't generalize this to everybody. So what did we find looking at all of these stories? We found that actually 75% of the organizations were not telling stories with a beginning, middle, and end, conflict and resolution, characters and setting. This is really alarming as someone who studies the science of storytelling because we know storytelling is the most powerful tool we have for increasing people's understanding of complex issues, of connecting to their memory, to helping people care about the characters, and a lot of organizations are trying, saying they're telling stories, but they're not telling stories in ways that gain all of the cognitive benefits of storytelling. And so one of the things that we could actually be doing as a, as a sector is actually telling stories, which is a really great opportunity for all of us to be doing. We also saw that 40% of the stories represented poor people as a homogenous group of people, similar to the academic research. They didn't have names, they didn't, there wasn't any unique um, distinctions between people. We saw that 41% of the stories framed poor people as being need, in need of saving. And we think that this might be because a lot of these organizations are telling stories to increase donations and charity and support for the work that they do. And so they're situating themselves as the hero in the story coming in to save people who are in need rather than telling stories of collective action. Um, we saw that 31% of stories included references to systems of oppression, which is great. However, they did more than half did not reference race or racism. And I think one of the things that we need to do to move our storytelling from abstract to concrete is be very specific with how systems work and show how white supremacy, capitalism, sexism, patriarchy, all of those isms are shaping the experiences that people have within society. Um, and we saw that 70% of stories featured organizations with power, less than half of those stories included characters as having power. And again, I think this is a result of organizations justifying the work that they do by featuring themselves as the hero so they can increase the amount of donations and funding and support. This is a conundrum for people working in the field because you have to tell stories for your donors for, to legitimize your role in the, in the sector but I think there's space for us to do better where we can both show the importance of all of the organizations working in this space while also featuring collective action as the solution, not individual organizations. So sharing that, I would love for you all to take a moment to reflect on these findings. Have you seen this in your work? Um, do you see this at your own organization? Are you at an organization where you're working actively to, to challenge some of these narratives that are coming out of our field? And if you are, what are some of the best practices that you've used? So go ahead and share that in the chat so you can all learn from each other. Um, great. And while you're doing that, we're going at lightning speed. So I think we'll have a lot of time for discussion so we can go back to this question. While you're doing that, I want to give you some good news. We not only looked at some of the harmful, pervasive narratives that are coming out of our sector, but also some of the good ones that um, some of the organizations that are telling incredible stories for economic justice. And before I jump into that, I just want to say that while these, narr these narratives are harmful, they're often as a result of trying to counter some other harmful narratives. And so we have to be very intentional with how we craft stories 
So that way in our effort to counter something that's even more pervasive, like all the narratives that Trina shared with us, we don't inadvertently create a new narrative of homeless people as needing to pull themselves up by their bootstraps and need of saving. Um, so we wanted to know which organizations are telling great stories about economic justice based off of the rubric that I shared with you. So we used that rubric to find in our social listening organizations doing that really well. Our team is also part of this sector and observing what people are doing. And so we also chose organizations that we've seen doing incredible work and shared it with among our team and asked who we wanted to talk to in addition to the names we found from the social listening. So we interviewed um, these different organizations, Coalition of Immokalee's Farm Workers, Southerners on New Ground, Migrant Justice, Invisible People, Action Center on Race and the Economy, and the Economic Security Project. We interviewed representatives from each of these organizations and asked them about their storytelling practices because we saw that the stories they were putting into the world were really wonderful in building a new narrative around economic justice. Um, and what is really exciting to me about this list is that there's such different organizations. There's small organizations, there's big organizations, there's media organizations, and some of them have comms people and some of them don't but yet they're all able to tell stories in ways that reflect the best of what we know from the research on systems change storytelling. So here's what we learned from them. First, we need to tell stories about individuals navigating systems and engaging in collective action to disrupt power. Second, we need to create space for people to come together and talk about systems and build their critical consciousness and consensus around the challenges. We need to problematize current narratives by looking back at history and seeing how what we're seeing today is deeply tied to power and injustice that was established at the beginning of our country. Um, we need to build the capacity of communities to share their stories. We need to use visual images and language to engage communities, and we need to amplify stories ethically. We go deep into each of these principles in our report, but today I wanna to go deep into just four of them. Um, and I'm going to share with you what we learned from each of the organizations and examples around each of these four uh, principles. So the first thing is that we have to tell stories about systems and collective action. When you think about story, you have the narrative arc with a beginning, middle and end, conflict and resolution, characters and settings. To tell system stories, we need characters making decisions and interacting with systemic barriers and uh, systemic oppression. So we understand and we see with our own eyes or hear with our ears or, or feel through the character's experiences what that, uh, that systemic oppression looks and feels like. At the same time, while we're experiencing those systems through the character's experience, we also need to see that these characters have agency, um, and they're part of a collective of people who are engaging in collective action, where the moral of the story is not give to this organization or see people can pull themselves up by their bootstraps, but rather system change happen, systems change happens when we all come together and fight for something different. For example, we had the opportunity to interview people from Southerners on New Ground, and this is an organization that has root, uh, values deeply tied to their identity as LGBTQ black activists. And so every single thing that they do, how they define the problems, how they define the solutions, how they tell stories, how they come to decisions are deeply tied to those shared values. So when they're telling stories, they're telling stories about injustice to people from an intersectional lens and the solutions that they offer are, are about collective action, about people coming together across differences to change systems. So ask yourself, how can you tell stories that feature systems as settings and characters engaging in collective action? And I encourage you to look for examples of what this looks like as a way to start building your own skills to do that. And just as a plug, I love the podcast, The Some of Us, Heather McGee, does this incredibly well where she shows characters navigating systems and coming together to build cross racial, racial coalitions that create social change. 
Our second principle is that we have to use justice frames in storytelling. So to put my academic hat on, in, in the sociology of social movements, we define a frame as having a definition of a problem and a definition of a solution. And so when you're telling stories, embedded in your stories are those frames. How are we defining the problem and how are we defining the solution? And what we saw from these organizations was that they defined the problem as injustice, as inhumane conditions, as people being um, unfairly treated. And the solutions was justice for these individuals, was critical consciousness and people coming together to change the system because they were creating inhumane conditions. And so as you're telling stories, step, take a step back and say, what is, how am I defining the problem and how am I defining the solution? And does this frame move us toward justice or does this frame offer something different that is counterproductive to the world we're trying to create? For example, Immokalee's Farm Workers does an incredible job telling stories about um, uh, fast food workers and farm workers. And um, they tell stories of the inhumane conditions that these workers are working in. And they offer solutions where not just workers are coming together, but customers are coming together to support these workers and change their purchasing behavior in order to change these inhumane conditions. And so if you look at their content, it has this justice frame throughout. So ask yourself, how can you frame the problem and solution as injustice and justice? Injustice as the problem, justice as the solution. Our next principle is build the capacity of communities to share their stories. And I know Nonprofit Quarterly just put something out that said, let's stop saying build capacity. Um, and so we can replace this, word, this uh, phrase with something else, but essentially we want to create space and hand power over to communities to share their own stories. Migrant justice does this incredibly well. They bring workers in and help build their political identity as members of this movement. And then they become the leaders of the movement and share their stories as they're organizing others to join in the fight for migrant rights. And I'm gonna share an example at the, um, in a little bit from a particular organizer that does is a great example of this. So ask yourself, how are you going to work with communities to tell their own stories? And if you are doing that, how can you help other organizations do that as well? Now, it's important to tell our work with communities to tell their own stories, but we have to make sure that we're doing so with care and ethically. Uh, one of the things that we've learned studying the science of storytelling is that people who are most affected by an issue or who have lived experience are the most effective storytellers because their stories are authentic and when those stories feel authentic, they feel more true. So I can share the story of a migrant worker or a migrant worker can share their own story and they would both be true. But according to the research, the migrant worker telling their story will feel more true and more authentic because it's coming from them. So we know that that's powerful, but what we've also seen in the research and in practice is that people who are sharing their stories often feel re-traumatized in sharing their stories. They feel like they're being used for good PR. They feel like um, they're, they're being um, tokenized for their experience. And so there's a number of practitioners who are thinking about now, how do we tell stories ethically, including the organizations that we talk to? Invisible People is a great organization that's telling stories about homelessness and housing. And what they do is go out and they film people unedited um, who are experiencing homelessness and they just tell their stories. They also um, put together scripted stories about eviction, about what it means to be, to live without a home. And they also do documentaries. What I loved about this, the way they work is that they, they engage people who are experiencing homelessness as you might engage any partner on a project. They provide them and they pay them an actor's rate. If somebody shares their story, they own the rights to that story and they can ask for it to be taken off of YouTube at any time. And so it's, it's compensating people for their time and treating them as experts and professionals in sharing their own stories. I also just wanna highlight an example that comes not from this work, but from one, an organization that we truly admire, Define American. 
they did similar work where they went out and they talked to activists who share their stories as part of the undocumented movement. And they found that they felt re-traumatized and used for their story. So they worked with those activists to identify a set of things that Define American could do to ensure that they're sharing stories ethically. And you can see here some of those recommendations. They ask things like, is now a good time to share your story? What do you feel comfortable sharing? Have you shared your story before? They offer compensation and a timeline for involvement. And they ensure that pronouns and gender identity and the pronunci pronunciation of names is respected. So I encourage you to use this if you're thinking about how to tell stories ethically. So my question for you all is how will you take care of the storyteller? What kind of practices can you start to implement in your own work or across your organization that will ensure that people who are sharing their stories um, are taken care of and, don't, and do not feel used or re-traumatized? I encourage you all to check out this um, talk. I'm not gonna play it now because of time, but this is a talk from Enrique Balcazar and he is with Migrant Justice. And he gave a talk at the Frank Gathering called The Cows Don't Milk Themselves about how he became a member of the migrant justice movement. And he tells the story of um, moving to Vermont and the, the living conditions that he found himself in in the low wages and the inability to connect with other people because of language barriers and, and just the, the landscape of Vermont. And then he goes in and to tell the story about how he joined the movement by going to meetings, building relationships, building his critical consciousness, and how they worked on a campaign to um, increase the living, the, the wages for migrant workers um, who, who do dairy work for Ben and Jerry's. So I encourage you to watch it. And as you're watching it, look at, analyze it for all of the principles that we've shared with you so far. And you'll see that it's incredible storytelling. It features a person who has lived experience. It tells system stories and features collective action. It has a justice frame. It has all of the principles that we've shared with you and is a wonderful example of how you can do this your, yourself in your work. So with that, I am now going to hand it over to Michael, who will talk about how we approach design. Thanks, Annie. Um, yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, as mentioned earlier on, design and creative strategy played in an integral role in not only the dissemination of this work, but was integrated into the development and definition of this project from the very beginning. So today I'm gonna specifically talk about how creative was incorporated into Broke and why it's so important to think about design and distribution as early as possible uh, in, in really all uh, social impact work, uh, especially narrative change work. And for those uh, uh, creatives in the audience uh, or, or those who work closely with creatives on at your organizations or teams, um, the most important piece is how to do this efficiently and with intention. Um, before I jump into all that, I want to take a step back first and um, recenter what it means to be a creative of any kind around movement and social change work. Um, uh, it's really easy to lose your place in this type of work. So one mantra that has been a guiding light for my team and myself is this quote by the late, great Tony K. Bambara, uh, the role of the artist is to make the revolution irresistible. A creative work of all kinds often gets sidelined, um, mostly unintentionally, uh, for seemingly more important elements of a project and seen more as a means to an end uh, once the research or the content has been created. Um, but we should never forget the role that art has played throughout history of, in all of progress and revolutions. Um, uh, and that ultimately, um, you know, you're going to have to have someone design the PDF. So um, trying to figure out how to be a lot more intentional about that type, that process, the creative process in your work is uh, only going to help um, everyone and especially um, help you reach your audiences better. Um, sorry, thanks. Slight change. Uh, so, so here are some some frames from um, the initial uh, stage of our process, our creative process, and this was uh, this really kind of shows the initial dialogue between um, our creative team and the larger project team, um, and 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 it's really a, a, a something that can be thought of in any really in any project um, when a creative team comes in, and so. 
um, in this case, uh, you know, we work closely with our research fellows and the folks who were, you know, uh, kind of scaffolding the entire project itself and the content that would ultimately uh, be a part of it and, and, and really tried to think intentionally about um, how to develop a brand platform, um, a voice, um, a, a visual treatment, if you will. Um, all of these are important elements um, that often get brushed aside because, you know, we all are struggling uh, against timelines and um, trying to get the work done. Um, uh, but but the powerful foundation that you can create um, can really take a project a lot further than you could ever imagine if you're able to spend some time uh, in this part of the process. Uh, for creatives, this means acknowledging our proximity to the work, knowing that we have to listen and honor the folks closest to the work itself. Um, and I think for the project team or anyone on the other side of that is recognizing the power and potential of the creative process and how it can take your work and um, take it a lot further than you could ever imagine, as I mentioned. Um, and so as you can see here, you know, we we went through, um, this is just a glimpse of all of the exercises that we went through to, you know, uh, really hone in on the voice of the project um, and how uh, visually um, the and the feelings that we should evoke through the visuals of the project. Um, how this creative strategy uh, eventually showed up visually was informed by the very societal tropes we're critiquing. Um, this was the fun part. Uh, we were able to draw from our hyper-capitalistic culture, consumer brands, cultural touch points, um, uh, the overload of content, the matrix, uh, if you will, um, all of that coming together with the goal of developing a visual direction that was, um, you know, not only something beautiful and, you know, uh, interesting to look at, but deeply engaging and, um, for lack of a better term, scroll stopping. Um, you can't discount the impact uh, of taking work like this and wrapping it in visually stimulating and culturally relevant design. Um, this can take a project uh, really that extra uh, distance to reach the people who need to see it the most, especially in, in kind of this world of oversaturation when it comes to content. And so um, really looking at, you know, what was visually on trend, but also what could, you know, uh, be a little bit timeless around the project itself. Uh, and at the end of the day, really um, uh, feel like something people really wanted to engage with right off the bat. Next slide. Um, and so the result, as all this came together, was a powerful um, set of tools and ideas that could live across mediums and executions. Um, we leveraged static design, long form writing, video, interactive web experiences, uh, all kind of built into this uh, cohesive and beautiful visual system. You know, storytelling and especially a narrative change really needs this level of visual intention to truly achieve impact. Uh, in, in a world where I mean, folks are constantly bombarded by stories and content. And so uh, really looking at um, all this coming together um, and connecting all the pieces visually um, and from uh, and, uh, also with the user experience in mind uh, was a really key part of this project um, as we move through it over the, the, the course of the years. Uh, and also, you know, it, it's not to, it, it's important to mention that it's something that we were really proud of. It's something that we got really excited around as we moved through it as, um, you know, embattled um, change makers ourselves, right? And so that's that's really important to have that inherent uh, internal uh, empowerment and self-determinism as you move through a project, because uh, we know, all know the fatigue that can, can set in. <clears throat> Next slide. And so uh, where, where all this kind of came together as the design of the project and the research of the content behind the content itself coalesced, our roles as creatives um, also evolved into the distributors, um, and we consistently looked at how our audience would ultimately engage with the work and how we could make that experience the best that it could be. And we're still doing that. Um, we're looking at feedback. We're hearing folks respond to worksheets and pieces of the website, um, you know, and that's a big part of being creatives and designers. Um, this resulted in, um, a, in a, an engagement ecosystem uh, with clear and intentional milestones. Um, as you can see, the web experience is kind of the centerpiece of the project, uh, and that plays a critical role in both um, receiving uh, audience and um, attention and traffic, but also uh, being a place where that content then continues to uh, roll out. Uh, as you've seen throughout um, even this presentation, the template, um, the content 
the the visuals, the high quality elements throughout this project, the way that we um, take information, research, and content itself, and are able to make it um, visually stimulating and digestible um, is a big part of the philosophy behind this project. Uh, and then, of course, we get to the resources and tools itself, um, the robust reports, the worksheets, the downloadable pieces, the artifacts, if you will. All of that is um, also intentionally designed and, in, and integrated into our social presence, our web experience. Uh, and then finally, amplification and thinking about um, how all this works together from word of mouth and how we're um, creating content um, to uh, continue to supplement um, different parts of the project or different moments um, as we continue to grow the community around um, this work. Um, and then even earn media, such as us being here right now, speaking to you, um, that's all a part of it. And so uh, being able to uh, see all of it come to life, but also think um, kind of consistently as creatives and designers, not just from the perspective of storytelling, but being able to do the, the story justice uh, by making sure it gets in front of people in a way that is um, is, is engaging, is important um, to the kind of ethos of this project. And, um, you know, uh, it, it's it's such a different experience um, incorporating all this early on and into the DNA of the project versus kind of waiting till the end to hand it off to a designer. Um, for those of you on the other side of the process and working within the project, you know the the the, the research, for example, you will quickly see how critical all this type of thinking and intention uh, will 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 do for the impact of the project. Um, and so I'll leave you with uh, three tips uh, uh, that can, you know, help hopefully anyone and everyone um, in, in their organizations and the work they do. Uh, and, the, and the most important caveat is, of course, we got funding to be able to do a lot of this work. And so that's something we're really grateful. And we under, I, I understand, especially as a creative in an agency on the agency side, um, how, you know, there's not always budget for that kind of thing. And so um, whether it's the in-house designer that you have part-time working for you guys, or if you do have the capacity to work with a larger team, involve them early on. Um, give them kind of the self-determination and empowerment to, um, you know, provide insight and feedback on the project as you guys form it. Um, you know, thinking about the end result, thinking about the the way you're going to engage the folks you need to engage. Um, having the designer or a design team involved at that stage is really critical and will only bear fruit. Um, secondly, map your audience's journey early on, thinking about, again, the way that folks will um, interact with the work um, is so important in the way that you develop that work. I mean, I still remember initial meetings just deriding PDFs and saying, what are we, we're not going to do just a PDF. Come on, guys. <laughs> and so that that really, even that that mantra itself really helped us you know, get through all this, this entire project with every piece in mind, what, a, what does a web experience look like? And especially with COVID thinking about that, like, how do we want to make this really accessible online? Um, and not just like a clunky website where you have to hit a download button, right? And so um, mapping that journey, um, you know, and making sure that um, in an empathetic way, you're thinking about how do we get this to people in the most effective way possible? Um, that's a design idea. That's a design piece. Um, and then finally, leveraging all the technology, um, you know, uh, it, it can't be said enough, right? There are so many tools out there that make this type of work easier. Google Slides, Canva, um, figuring out and working with your designer or design team to look at something and say, all right, instead of recreating or building something every time we need to do, like create a workshop, a worksheet, how could we create a set of templates that allow us to create multiple presentations that um, are, are, we're able to leverage for different types of, um, of uh, audiences and presentations, right? And, and being able to design and create those templates early on and thinking about that for your own team and for the research team and for those who are out there evangelizing the work. Um, can we create a set of tools that allows for, um, you know, the project to not only stay visually cohesive and intact, but really does, you know, allow allows for everyone to really uh, um, uh, um, push out the project in um, the, the best way possible. Um, and so with that, I will pass it back. Great. Um, so now we're going to turn to questions and observations, but before we do, we just want to say thank you so much for your time. Please go to brokeproject.org to watch the video and share it with your friends on social um, or at your next 
team meeting. You can download all of the tools and resources that we've created for you. And of course, you can download our PDF, but that's not the only thing you could do on our website. And you can access the timeline that um, we shared with you. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and turn it back over to Chanel and to Steve. Steve. To Steve. Okay. Hey, um, so I'm back on screen. And uh, wow, I just feel like we've been given a, a clinic on design and storytelling and narrative. Um, and there's a number of questions from the audience. So I'm going to try to get to as many as I can. Of course, if you haven't put your question in the question and answer box, please do so. And we'll see how many we can get through. Um, but thank you. Uh, you know, Trina, uh, Trina's not here, but Trina, uh, Annie, Michael, Chanel, uh, really fabulous. Um, so one question that came up a lot, um, and you did discuss this in terms of um, ethical amplification, but the question of trauma and traumatizing the people that um, you're telling the stories about, how do you, you know, what are some strategies that you might want to add um, in terms of avoiding that? Anybody can jump in. Can start with a couple of things. This was a really, yeah, good question. It comes up all the time. And I think Abigail may have dropped a link to a Spitfire training uh, in the chat that can give you some more details. So I'll just name a couple of best practices. Um, when we talk about traumatizing people, uh, you know, some of that comes from being transactional, which means that you're not building relationships with people or organizations, coalitions, or communities before you uh, ask them about sharing their stories. And so there needs to be some mutual respect there, trust and collaboration before you just jump into asking people to tell their stories. Um, ultimately, if you just kind of put your human hat on and not your nonprofit worker, hat on and just imagine uh, how you would want to be treated, you know, taking some care into con in consideration into preparing yourself and your organization for story sharing feels really important. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, in relation, and it's, it's, there's not like we go somewhere where they, they're like, hey, here's how you build relationships with people, <laughs> you know, uh, it, you know, especially when it comes to our work, if we're talking about centering the people who have um, the most oppressed, the people with the most, uh, the, cl the closest people to the trauma and the experience, then we need to um, first learn about them and figure out who they are. And um, I would also say prioritizing ongoing informed consent. So um, especially if you work with people who are living at the intersection of, you know, racism, sexism, uh, homophobia, transphobia, um, you know, survivors, then it's going to be really important to continuously ask if it's still cool, you know, to share their stories. Are they still interested in working uh, with you, being transparent throughout the process and ensuring that they have ownership and control over their stories, which we talked about before. Um, honoring authenticity uh, is really important and complexity. Um, so, yeah, we're talking about people who are poor. Those people who are poor have a lot of other identities that matter. Um, and, you know, um, there's a fear. There's a fear for a lot of people being perceived as poor. Um, a lot of people will kind of punch up into a middle class um, frame talking about themselves. And, and part of that is that there's a lot of shame and stigma, stigma around poverty. And so, you know, when we corner people into just being one thing or the other, um, especially those identities that are stigmatized, um, it can, people can carry a lot of shame. And, um, and so, you know, honoring a person's whole, whole experience. And then I would say like around the trauma part, there are trauma informed storytelling workshops now that you can take. Um, and I would just say that if you or your organization spends a lot of time telling stories, you might want to pursue one of those as a professional development opportunity to learn what it means to to engage people who are uh, survivors of oppressive systems. And I will stop there. Thanks, Chanel. Um, this I thought was a really interesting question. I'm sure it applies to a number of the people um, on the call. So the, 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 this is an anonymous question that says, we are a poverty alleviation organization and in the process of redoing our mission, how do we talk about what we do in our mission without perpetuating tropes about poverty. And maybe there's actually some case studies that any of you can share of, of folks who have gone through that process. Um, I'm happy to jump in. 
In the case studies that we looked at, there was one example. Um, it was it was a um, it was a graduate student's dissertation work, and she was looking at organizations, community organizations in Los Angeles. And one of the things that they did was both work to tell stories about poverty and the need to alleviate it, and also told stories to build critical consciousness of systemic inequality as part of their activism work. So they brought together both activism and their organizational storytelling that they needed to do around the work that they did. But I would push organizations to think about taking moving away from a public relations approach where you're communicating about um, just the organizations and you're looking at how many likes, how many shares, how many donations, how many people are talking about us, and instead see yourself as part of a bigger network of people building a world where everyone has the, uh, the ability to live with dignity and experience equality and justice and mental and physical well-being. So if you're part of this larger movement of a network of people doing that, then how you tell stories and, and your role in that story, I think will look different because you're not telling stories to justify your position. You're telling stories about how you are part of this bigger effort across the country to change the conditions. And I think that if we can just shift that way, that that would move us a lot closer to telling systems and collective action stories than telling stories about organizations helping individual poor people move out of poverty. Thanks. Um, somewhat related question, but different. There's a number of questions actually about uh, grant proposals, and I'm sure you've come across this. You know, you have to show need, right? And so you end up in a position um, where you are, in essence, repeating the tropes in order to get the money from the funder. So, you know, in, in say, a public grant space where you're, you're applying for government funding, for example, or philanthropic funding, uh, how do we approach narrative change to be, you know, responsive enough to the RFP so you get the funding, but, um, but do it in a way that doesn't um, reinforce those tropes? I mean, this is, sorry, this is so frustrating. Um, I'm sorry, everyone, that, you know, this is even a question that we have to contend with. Like, we're, we are making the world over now. That's the work that we're currently doing. And there's no silver bullet answer to solving for this. Like, when we did this research and we saw all the data that came back about the ways in which people are reinforcing harmful tropes, it wasn't surprising to us. Part of the reason why we invested in in the philanthropic and nonprofit sector to begin with this because we knew that we also had work to do. So it's like, we can't look at, you know, the government folks and be like, they're doing it wrong and extend any judgment because we're actually not doing it all the way right ourselves. So I think part of it is like, normalization is power. And so if you use the new frame, the liberatory language, the, uh, the narratives that are inclusive, the stories that are uh, meaningfully crafted, then in, in response to your RFP, and they read that, that helps to also shape their thinking, right? And so I, I would say, you know, I know it's hard to raise money. We, we know firsthand, we talk about this all the time, um, and that we're often in this very tough conundrum of needing to get the resources to do the work. Um, but I would say respond to the RFP with the language that you want to see. This is the prefigurative politic that I was talking about. You have to be the change, if you will, and you have to model what that looks like. And, you know, I I would hope that a person on the other end of that uh, would see that and be inspired as opposed to denying your grant application for those reasons. And I'd love to hear if Annie you wanted to add anything else to that. Well, that's what we did to get this grant. Um, we had a, sh um, a shared set of values from very different organizations. I mean, I'm at the University of Florida, the most institutional bureaucratic system you can think of. And Chanel um, is leading RADCOMS, which is the exact opposite. <laughs> and um, Millie, I know, is, is the same way. So we had to come to our shared values, what we, how we think change happens, and we worked collectively on the grant proposal, and it reflected those values, and they accepted it. One of the things that, one of the reasons why we're so um, we're, we are so in on storytelling is because 
storytelling can help people who don't see the way you see understand why you are taking the action you're taking. And so you can help them understand why this approach is different if you can use these um, principles from storytelling in your grant proposals to replace the existing narrative and assumptions that they have in their mind with a new one and help them see that this solution is the solution to the problem. I don't have that many experiences writing grants, so I can only speak to what I've had the opportunity to do, but that's how I would approach it. Thanks. Um, so another question, um, so switching gears a little bit, but I, I, I love this question, you know, how might arts and humanity organizations support economic justice focus organizations and movements through storytelling? So, um, Michael, maybe this is a question for you since you deal with design, but I, I'm curious about those kind of collaborations. Sorry, could you repeat the question? I was yeah. Uh, how how can deep. arts, you know, organizations in the arts support economic justice focus or organizations and help them develop their stories? Yeah, I mean, again, uh, uh, coming from. I guess technically the private sector on the art side of things, but having worked with a lot of arts and culture organizations, I think the the challenge is is that um, quite frankly the challenge is and with a lot of things the bureaucracy around it, right? Um, they, I think all arts organizations inherently have good intentions around being able to tell stories and telling them, you know, uh, um, accurately and doing justice to them. However, the what they run into is you know their the, the kind of the, the the barriers to being able, the barriers that are put on them by their kind of, you know, the, the powers that be, you know, especially with like city civic oriented arts organizations, which are usually the, the centers of power when it comes to um, the arts uh, in, in, in whatever metro you live in, right? Um, I think the great thing though is, especially here in like, for example, Seattle, is that those organizations are realizing how important it is for them to reach out to kind of non-affiliated organizations working with agencies like ours to be able to take that work further. And it's just another microcosm or just another example, a metaphor of what we've done here with Broke, right? Is um, being able to find ways to partner outside with folks who live in the different worlds they need to be in, right? How can we take the power of creative agencies or advertising agencies uh, and bring them into work like this um, and 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 leverage in their, their power and their tacit knowledge and ex expertise uh and, and 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 marry that to the work that that change makers and and storytellers are doing great thanks um let's see another audience question um so i'm gonna play with this one a little bit but it was asking about the role of the church and obviously you guys talked about the protestant ethic and so the role of the church in terms of um you know it's often you know, has often been the source of some of the tropes that you guys were talking about. Um, um, but I'm also curious if there are ways that you've been partnering in storytelling um, with faith-based organizations, because they can show up on sort of both the liberatory and less liberatory side of the ledger. I mean, I I, um, <clears throat> I saw this question and it, it feels a little bit tough to answer. I think what I would say is that the church, like political organizations, like other organizations, has a spectrum of beliefs. And, you know, certainly the church has also been a place where people who are poor can get some of their most immediate needs met. And so it's important to, I think, remember that there is a dominance and cultural power to, you know, the church and to religious uh, organizations that comes with these kind of pre-existing notions of benevolence that are grounded in, you know, morality and faith-based perspectives that are often also racist and sexist. Um, and also, you know, like other organizations, there, there are many faith-based organizations who are trying to rectify some of those uh, long-standing narratives and deeply held beliefs of those, you know, faith-based practices. The Unitarian Universalists are somebody that I have not work with on this specific issue, but work within the past on issues like reproductive justice and, and racial justice. Um, so I would say it's not all one size fits all, even like quote the church itself needs to be broken down into like, who are we talking about when we when we say that? And um, I, I think that what I'll say is like an organizer is that a church is where a place where people congregate. And so it's a place where people can be organized to 
um, be supported in advocating for their best interests and the best interests of their families. And so we shouldn't write off those spaces. Um, but, you know, at the Movement for Black Lives, where I work full time, we don't uh, work directly with faith-based faith -based organizations, but we work in coalition with them. And I think that um, in, the, in, their, in that space, we can share these ideas and this information. I hope that it, it, it lands. Great, thanks. Um, so this is, I think, a good question for anybody on the panel, but uh, if I wanted to get up to speed on the science of storytelling, what would you recommend I read? And the person adds, uh, sometimes I need to persuade others about the value of storytelling. Explain it's not just a fluffy feel-good add-on. Um, so any any sources you would recommend both for people's own reading or to you know, maybe persuade others in their organization that narrative is important? Um, I didn't mean to do caps and it might not be org, it might be .com. So, but anyways, at the Center for Public Interest Communications, we've studied the science of storytelling for six or seven years now, where we've convened scholars from a range of disciplines to study different elements of storytelling. And we write publicly about that. And you can find that on the scienceofstories.org where we share those principles. We've also shared them in the Stanford Social Innovation Review. Um, if you search um, storytelling, um, we've written about how to tell intersectional stories, how to tell complex stories, how to partner, how to build partnerships between funders, strategists, and storytellers. So we've written a lot about the science of that, but we also take a practitioner lens to that and try to make it very actionable. We recently just convened a number of practitioners and scholars to study the science of narrative change, and we're currently working on what does the science tell us on that? Um, which I'm hoping will release soon. And um, yeah, oh, and then we're also working with different organizations to experiment with storytelling and then we'll be sharing that publicly. But I would start with the sciencesstories.org. I also highly recommend Chanel's um, video recording. I think it was with Nonprofit Quarterly where you were talking about narrative power. Um, when I was teaching strategy, that was, uh, must watch for the students. Um, so those would be my recommendations. And then there's incredible work being done by um, lots of different organizations like Frameworks, the Norman Lear Center, Narrative Initiative, Pop Culture Collaborative. There are people working on narrative change on different issues. Like I know Trevor Smith is somebody who writes for Nonprofit Quarterly. He's writing about narrative change and reparations. Mia Birdsong, not songbird, bird song is writing about freedom narrative. So there are people who are writing about this that are looking for models that I um, can nerd out on forever. But um, I would start following them and look, looking at their advice and then follow the Center for the Science. Great, thanks. Um, another question from comes from the audience is, uh, you know, are you aware of any similar projects to what um, you guys are doing in economic justice with climate justice, because it's another problem that's, again, often framed in terms of deficits rather than assets or gains, um, you know, and, and is, you know, deeply in need of, you know, better storytelling. Um, I know that there are um, harmful narratives about uh, climate change being apocalyptic and um, the solutions being um, hard and scary and uh, and they're not helpful. And there's certainly certain characters that show up in these stories that are um, usually white men who are leading these charges. And so there's a lot of efforts to change that. The one that I know about that is really trying to experiment with their storytelling to change this narrative is coming actually out of National Geographic Society, they have just launched a story impact lab where they're experimenting with these ideas um, that are in the scienceofstories.org that are coming even from the work that we've done here because we're sharing it with them. And they're, they're experimenting with this and their hope is to move to a, a different narrative that is more complex that shows that people can interact with nature, that there's not, it's not either apocalyptic or inhuman made or just serene and absent of people, but people and nature can interact. Um, also, Samantha Wright, who was at Exposure Labs, is now working with Earth Alliance to do this as well. And she has is 
thinking a lot about how we tell stories about regeneration and build a whole network of people telling those stories. So I would follow Samantha Wright and I would follow National Geographic Society. Um, and then, yeah, I think those would be my recommendations. I want to add, or Michael. Yeah, I want to add one plug um, for the Black Hive, which is the Movement for Black Lives Climate Coalition. Um, there's more than 200 organizers, policy advocates, um, creatives who are working on building a national climate agenda that is centered on the needs of Black people. We firmly believe at M4BL, and I do uh, as well as a Black liberation organizer, that when Black people are free, everybody will be free if we're working um, to ensure that people who are hit first and worst by climate disasters, um, everybody else will uh, survive. So I would check out the Black Hive, the framing that they use in terms of how to advance um, issues around climate, including land, water, air, uh, energy, e the economy, and democracy. Um, they give some good ideas in their mandate on how we can talk about that. And I would also be happy to connect anyone who's interested, uh, especially if you come from a Black-led organization and joining the Hive. Thanks. Um, so this question, I'm not going to read the whole question because it's long, but it's talking about you know, the fact that there's not always an easy problem solution. In fact, many problems and solutions are complicated. So maybe talk about this, you know, the justice and justice frame and, and you know, how, how maybe add a little bit of nuance or complexity to how, how, how we deal with complex social problems where there may be multiple, you know, really, in fact, dealing with interconnected problems with interconnected solutions. So, you know, it's not just a simple problem solution frame. Um, I don't know. I don't know any simple um, <laughs> problem or solution. I I think that there's, you know, I'll just say I think that there's a binary of like either you you won or you didn't win. And I've been the chief communicator for the movement for Black Lives and Black Lives Matter Global Network since 2016. And I'll just say um, the issues that we contend with every day, from police terror to climate change to economic injustice, have really complicated solutions and. Part of it is that, um, you know, the, as, again, normalization is power and we're up against uh, long-standing, deep-seated, deeply held beliefs and narratives that drive how people understand people, places, things, and the social structures to which, you know, we're all kind of bound. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess, yeah, I would guess, I would guess I would just say that we need to demystify the idea that there's a silver bullet answer to any of this, like the the narrative power building work, the disrupting of hegemonic worldviews, the intervening to create new story ways and ways of understanding, new neural pathways in people's brains. This is a very long uh, practice. And, 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 and this is, it's not starting now. Like the work that Michael, Annie, Trina and I are doing is in the lineage of, you know, previous movement makers who come before us. Um, that's why I say, I think that we underestimate the sophistication of the work that we're doing because we have made significant headway, it's hard to feel and see because it, it seems so microscopic compared to the large systems of oppression. But I'll just say that all power relations related to the narrative element of this, all power relations have a narrative dimension. And in order to shift dominant culture, which is the ideas and the practices and the worldviews that have become normalized over time that disproportionately represent powerful institutions uh, and interest and perpetuate stories that validate their political agendas, we have to invest in political persuasion uh, towards the goal of political acceptance with strong values-led arguments. That, that is the only way that this is going to work. And we have to say it again and again and again and again, because when the target audience has heard it for the first time, you, you're probably sick and tired of it. Um, but that's what is required of us in this moment. And I think you know it's important for us to remember that persuasive discourse is really characterized by the resonance of the frames that we're using. And that's what this project is about. It's about offering a new set of frames or, or a more liberatory set of frames from organizations who are doing this on the ground that allow us to deploy those into public debate so that they gain political acceptance, so that our policymakers are talking about them, you know, in their press conferences, so that um, everyday people are going out into the street and organizing on behalf of them. And we can't assume that because we care, other people will care. And that's really what narrative power is about. It's about, you know, creating and normalization for these, what, what should not be considered, but are radical ideas. And so we need to amass authority and credibility through presentation and argument. And, um, you know, I can't stress enough, 
that we have to talk about race and class. I mean, it has to, this entire project, you know, when we think about, I saw that somebody really asked a question about like speaking to white people about communities of color. And I know that Michael's going to speak to that. What I'll say is like, we, we, we're not, we're past the point where we're trying to coddle people and, um, you know, stave off discomfort that there are black poor people or poor Asian people or poor, you know, trans kids, like we have to actually name the thing and talk about the thing to contend with that. And uh, there may be some some discomfort um, with engaging with those ideas, but it's certainly true that if you do it um, with any less rigor or discipline, we're going to have to start over because you will have skipped over the most in, important thing, which is that a lot of the oppressive systems that we're contending with are rooted in racist and sexist and transphobic and homophobic ideologies. And when you skip over that part, uh, you don't get to the root of the problem, which is why the Radical Communicators Network is called Radical. Uh, so I'll just say that I think it's my opinion that this the field of nonprofit and the nonprofit and philanthropic field doesn't take public discourse or persuasion, I, I don't think as seriously as it as it should. And we're seeing some of the effects of that right now with the deregulatory policies of our current um, and former administration. Thanks, Chanel. Uh, that was great. Um, Michael, it sounds like, uh, why don't I refer directly to you because Chanel sort of named you and then uh, we need to close out because we're almost at time. Cool. I'll make it really quick. Um, I, I just wanted to bring, uh, I kind of want to bridge the, the answers to both these questions that Chanel just answered to um, uh, across uh, with a, uh, like a design um, and creative um, mantra that came from John Cage, uh, that not knowing where to begin is a form of paralysis. And so begin anywhere. And I think that the beautiful thing about this project broke was that we had a mission. We we knew, and the thing we, is, we knew that the larger issue that we were tackling was not going to be done in this project. So we decided on a, a starting point, and we decided on narrative shift with specifically within the nonprofit space, right? And being able to uh, kind of answering the question previously is like solutions, problems, all that. That's all kind of made up and fabricated to allow us to find starting points and to move through the work and then focus on the things we need to focus. And so I think that's just a part of um, how we cope and how we how we tackle issues. And, and that's just a, it's a device, it's a tool. And so that was the starting point we chose. And just to quickly answer the question from Denise about how do we, you know, appeal to white donors or how do we navigate the, the need for stock photography? Um, the quick answer is hire a designer and talk to them and, and bring them into the work and they'll help you. Uh, the, the, the little bit longer answer um, is that uh, if stock photography is not doing it for you, then don't use stock photography. As, we, as you've seen with the work we've done, we use a lot of design, a lot of visual graphic elements to do the heavy lifting. Um, there is stock photography in our work because of the same issue you named, is that we don't want to create paradoxes. We don't want to violate people's privacy. We don't want to do any sort of um, uh, exploitation of people's trauma, that kind of thing. And so as designers and creatives, those are things that we take into consideration when we come up with solutions for your next campaign or for the next piece of work that you want to release. And so um, there is no quick answer. You want to do that work with a designer and create in mind and, and they have to think about it from not only the impact perspective but really what you can use like what are the tools at at, 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 um, at your disposal and stock photography may be the thing photography may not be the, the answer at all right if that's not working okay. thanks and i know uh, we're at time and chanel is a hard stop so i want to honor that uh thank you to uh trina and abstentia and chanel and annie and michael for an amazing panel and thanks to all of you and uh, MPQ's audience for your amazing questions. Um, and our next uh, Remaking Economy uh, webinar will be in the second Thursday of November. It'll be on leadership and uh, more details will be forthcoming. Uh, thanks everyone. And uh, there's a survey at the end, so please fill that out if you can. Thanks so much.